Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 10th Director's Dialogue on Art and Social Change. It's a program that we initiated here at the Wexner Center about, I don't know, um, 12 years ago, maybe. Um, and I'm sure that, um, especially recently, you, like all of us, have become ever more aware of uh, public institutions across the country, some of them cultural institutions, educational institutions, social service institutions, all of whom are focused around this new kind of buzzword of intersectionality, um, which is essentially simply to say where different social and economic, intellectual, cultural, um, and political forces combine to create some very complex societal conditions, um, conditions which are often highly challenging and in turn demand a kind of multi-dimensional um, approach, integrated thinking, nuanced thinking, and problem solving. Um, and it's perhaps because we are finding ourselves today in a world that seems fraught with these intersections um, for good and for not so good. Um, and perhaps because this is my last time presiding over a director's dialogue here at the Wexner Center that I find myself in a slightly reflective mood. So I hope um, you'll allow me to share just a few thoughts in that regard. Um, first and foremost, I could not be more grateful to my Wex colleagues um, from throughout the center, those you see and, and those you don't. Um, from the moment that we conceived this series, uh, they have been nothing but fiercely supported and committed to ensuring that each iteration of our director's dialogue be as rich and resonant and relevant as it could possibly be. Whether focusing on gender and sexuality, whether focusing on racial tension and discrimination, climate change, inequities in healthcare, police brutality, mass incarceration, or the right of free expression, and oftentimes combinations of all of those things. No matter the topic, we at the WEX have aimed to bring together local and national artists and experts to probe these issues, to spark fresh and meaningful dialogue, and I have special thanks to my director of education, Shelley Casto, um, and mostly to Alana Ryder over the past few years who took Amanda Potter's place in working closely on these dialogues with me. Looking back over some of our past participants, it's kind of a rogues gallery of nationally recognized and locally celebrated talents. Um, artists like Carrie James Marshall, Lynn Tillman, Anna DeVere Smith, Alexis Rockman, Liza Johnson, Jason Moran, and Anne Hamilton, just to name a few. And also scholars and experts, some of whom are from The Ohio State University and others from further afield, Patricia Williams, Lonnie Thompson, Leslie Alexander, Towson Price Spratlin, excuse me. We've drawn together the most illustrious thinkers and innovators, practitioners, and makers to bring a truly rigorous um, and nuanced conversation to today's most urgent issues. And I would also like to acknowledge the anonymous donor who couldn't be with us this evening, uh, but whose generosity helped us to launch this series. From the center's very inception in 1989, um, which I can take no credit for, I wasn't here, but it's really plain to see that whether in our galleries, on stage, on screen, or behind the podium, um, art and artists do serve as truly vital catalysts and as change agents in our culture. And I know that the WEX team joins me in thanking all of you for being part of those conversations over the years. So that brings me to our program this evening. Um, if there is anyone left in Columbus who doesn't know Will Haygood, then they are living somewhere underground. 
Um, he is not only nationally acclaimed um, and a decorated journalist, author, cultural historian, and filmmaker, he has brought his considerable creative prowess to subjects ranging um, from such lions in, in their respective fields as Adam Clayton Powell, Sugar Ray Robinson, Sammy Davis Jr., and to those for whom without Will's recognition would never have had their names known, um, namely Eugene Butler, the extraordinary man who served as a butler in the White House under the auspices of eight different presidents. And it was, of course, that latter story in the Washington Post and then the film that was being made about it that first brought Will and, and me together, although I certainly knew about the Haygoods of Columbus. That was our first time really interacting. Um, very much thanks to Larry James, who, as I'm sure many of you in the audience know, um, helps to make so many connections possible in this community. Um, and certainly is the major force behind the current citywide celebration celebrating the centenary of the Harlem Renaissance, which tonight's program is, is a part. Um, I think that some of you may have been with us when we welcomed Will here in 2013 for the Midwest premiere of Daniel, um, Lee Daniels' film, The Butler. Um, but I couldn't be more thrilled that my last director's dialogue here takes as a point of inspiration Will's latest work. And as just a, a brief, um, but I feel um, essential aside, I think some of you are also aware of Will's book um, from 2016 entitled Thurgood Marshall and the Supreme Court nomination that changed America. Referring, referring, of course, to that momentous occasion in 1967 when Congress confirmed this country's first African-American Supreme Court justice. Alas, uh, I'm afraid that um, Mr. Haygood could now um, write a more heartbreaking, although equally dramatic, um, less ennobling sequel to that event about a certain Supreme Court nomination some 50 years later that I think could well mark the end of a certain kind of progressive, progressivism um, in our judicial world. Um, and I don't know if it's something we'll, we'll turn his pen to, but I'm sure it would be fascinating. But while Thurgood Marshall's triumph played out um, on the national stage, there was another unlikely triumph happening right here in Columbus as the East High School Tigers of 1968-69 miraculously prevailed right here in Columbus amidst a nation that was truly roiling amidst political, social, and racial unrest, some of which remains with us to this day. Um, Will's story about the Tigers is a remarkable and uplifting saga about which you'll see in a few moments a video clip. And then following that, you will hear from Will personally, um, and then he will in turn welcome tonight's Director's Dialogue panelists, each of whom has a very special and very personal perspective on that moment 50 years ago. Uh, the panelists will be in, in turn introduced to you by uh, Chris Bournet, who himself is a Columbus-based journalist and author, and most recently filmmaker as well. Um, his film from last year, uh, Lady Wrestler, The Amazing Untold Story of African American Women in the Ring, was screened here at the WEX um, earlier this year. Uh, and now, as I cue the video, let me simply thank you all again for being here, not just tonight, but always, um, and for making the WEX your go-to place for culture, for conversation, for critical thinking, and for creative discovery. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to tell you a personal story about sports and my own glory of playing sports. But I unfortunately do not have that kind of story to share with you. <laughs> now, I did play on the varsity basketball team at Franklin Heights High School in the 11th and 12th grade. But I set the bench. There were whole games where I didn't even play. And I would ride the bus home and I would be thinking to myself, what in the world is wrong with that coach? And then I went to Miami University and I went out for the junior varsity team. Now this was a guy who never started in high school. I made the junior varsity team at Miami University. I set the bench. <laughs> Against Ball State, I broke out of a scoring slump and scored four points. So fast forward many, many, many years later, and three weeks ago, I was on the campus of my alma mater, Miami University. I was called down to the football field at halftime. The game was on ESPN. I did not know why the school president, Gregory Crawford, or the athletic director, David Saylor, wanted me down on the football field. But there I was. And they had a gift, and it was wrapped. And they unwrapped it in front of me. It was the most beautiful red and white varsity letter jacket that you would ever see. So all you varsity, varsity Buckeye athletes who are here, I'm touched that you're here. When you see Will Hager walking down High Street in a varsity Miami letter jacket, you can give me a high five. <laughs> I'm very touched that Sherry invited me here. As I get ready in the fly across country on this book tour, Alana has also been amazing with all of the details and bringing all of the panelists together. This is a very special program and I'm honored to be here. I grew up in this city and lived on the north side. So when I was a kid, Ohio State basketball and football and track was everything. There were no pro sports in this town. But because we came out of an era of segregation, there were never as many black athletes at these Big Ten schools that you wanted to be at these schools. There was always one black on the basketball team. There were more on the Ohio State football team. But to a little black kid, you would root for the whole team, of course, but there was something special when you saw somebody who was a scholar athlete who was African-American at the Ohio State University because if you knew your history, you, you knew that that athlete's road to Ohio State was an arduous road. 
Jesse Owens, who ran track here, couldn't even live in a campus dormitory. So this book that I've written means a whole lot to me. Stories that get lost sometimes stay lost. My tribute to history, intercultural history, is to go out to sea sometimes and put an anchor there and dive down to the sea and look under a whole lot of rocks and find a pearl. That's the story about the White House butler. In the story about these athletes that seem to have been lost. If there was any justice 50 years ago, because they won two state championships in a time of turmoil, they would have wound up on a box of Wheaties. But they did not. All I can try to do in my work is even the playing field. I thank you all for being here, and now I would like to bring our distinguished panelists to the stage. Well, thank you all for being here. I want to thank the Wexner Center and Sherry for hosting all of us and for inviting me to do this as an Ohio State alumnus and an artist who benefited from a Wexner Center residency. It's a real honor for me to sit on this stage. And I want to thank all of you for coming out. And I especially want to thank Will for writing this wonderful book, which is the reason we're all here tonight. So, so the format for the panel I will briefly introduce each panelist. Will needs no introduction, obviously. And then I will e ask each panelist a question. And after each one of them has asked a question, I'll go back down the line again. And as moderator, it's my role to sometimes play bad cop. So just to keep us on track, we want to make time for all of you if you have questions. So I may occasionally interrupt if I have to keep everybody uh, on schedule. So starting with uh, the introductions, to my right here, Paul Pinnell served the Columbus Public Schools as a teacher and award-winning head basketball, baseball and basketball coach for over 30 years at East High School and Briggs High School. Yes. Yes, Mr. Pinnell led the East High School baseball team to the state championship in 1969 and the Briggs High School basketball team to the Final Four in the 1991 state tournament. He holds a bachelor's degree from Ohio State and a master's degree in education from Xavier University. Alice Flowers was an East High School cheerleader and homecoming queen in the 1968-69 school year. We have the homecoming queen here, you all. <laughs> She holds a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Central State University and a master's degree in guidance and counseling from Ohio State. She is now retired after a long and successful career with the Columbus City Schools. Jack Gibbs Jr. is a probate attorney and Columbus native who once lived in the historic Poindexter Village, Ohio's first public housing project, and played football in the Westgate Hawks Boys Club. His father, the legendary Jack Gibbs Sr., not only coached the team, but also became the first black principal at East High School from 1967 to 1971. And he was, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, Jack Gibbs' father was known as the savior of the 1954 <laughs> Ohio State-Michigan game as a fullback for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Mr. Gibbs attended Michigan State University and Capital University Law School and was admitted to the bar for the state of Ohio as well as the United States District Court for the Southern District of Ohio and the United States Supreme Court. So William Bill Shakurdi is the author of The Ohio State University in the 60s, The Unraveling of the Old Order 
which was published in 2016, and Soldiering On in a Dying War, the true story of the fire, fire based PACE incidents and the Vietnam Drawdown, which was published in 2011. In addition to earning a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in public administration from Ohio State, Mr. Shikurdi has served as an Army artillery officer, a state budget director, and Ohio State's chief financial officer. Though retired, he remains involved with the university as an adjunct professor in the John, John Glenn School of Public Affairs. So my first question is for Will. So Will, you have truly been on a whirlwind book tour for <laughs> Tigerland, and you were in Toledo last week, and the Toledo Blade quoted you as saying that you're, as an author, you try to find stories that have been hidden in the shadows and anchored out to sea. So my question for you is, why did you feel this story of Tigerland of the 1968-69 basketball and baseball championships, why was that a story that you wanted to bring into the light? Um, well, um, this is a sports mad nation. It is, you know. Uh, and we all watch sports a lot. Um, but so often with sports, if you look deeper, there can be a fascinating story in those wins and losses. And if a story that had greatness attached to it happened in that, in that historic calendar year of 1968, 1969, um, it really gives you a lot to work with. An all black team in a segregated city, two state championships, 55 days apart, uh, when I was talking to my book editor in New York and I told him that after showdown and I told him that I was thinking about two book ideas, he asked me to tell him about those ideas and I did. The first one I told him was about movies and Hollywood and how we view the country through movies. That was my first idea. And the second idea, and I said to my editor, I said, and there's this you know, he said, after the first idea, he said, mm, well, okay, uh, you know, <laughs> okay. And then the second idea, I told him, well, there's a school, East High School, it was all black in 1968, 69. Martin Luther King Jr. had a link to it, and because of a local minister fell hell. And the school's basketball team didn't lose a game that mm -hmm. season. School's baseball team had a five game losing streak, but also won the state championship. They sent more African Americans to college that year than ever before because the students really wanted to pay a legacy to Martin Luther King Jr. And my editor listened and he said, when are you gonna start work on that book? <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just a story that he knew it was important to tell, and so did I. Great, great. So Paul, in Tigerland, Will describes how um, East High School's accomplishments, uh, they were a championship amidst tanks and bullets. So as the head coach of East High School's baseball team, did the turmoil that was going on in the nation at the time, uh, politically and racially, did it ever make it challenging for you to do your job? Well, I think the times themselves made the job challenging. Uh, it's important to understand at that time what we had at East High School. Uh, we had an unbelievable faculty, which I was so proud to be a part. We had a student body that looked forward to coming to school every day, it seemed like. And then we had Jack Gibb as our principal, and he was so far ahead of the administrative curve. I'm, I was asked to think about if there are any teachers or administrators in the audience tonight, what do you think would happen if your principal had teachers meetings 18 straight Mondays after school? <laughs> <laughs> you talk about revolt. <laughs> the union would go nuts. Well, 
Did Jack Gibbs have his detractors? Absolutely. But we had these meetings. Sometimes he'd bring a, a speaker in. Sometimes we'd talk amongst ourselves, uh, make one another aware. Were there any hot spots we need to be aware of possibly coming up with the times as they were? But that, that was so important in, in how we handled the challenging time. And another in, incident I'll, I'll relate, and I won't mention a school by name, but walkouts were very common at that time in, in the various schools. And one local high school, I might add, led by an administrator, marched their kids past our school and taunted our kids. They stood tall and they stood firm. And that's what East, East High School was all about. It was a challenging time, no question about it. With what we had, I think we met the challenge and got through it all. Excellent. So Alice, as I mentioned, you were a cheerleader and a homecoming queen in that 1968-1969 championship season. So what was it like being that, in that male-dominated environment? And at the time, and correct me if I'm wrong, girls' sports did not even exist at East High School at that time. So how did you see your role? Was it just to support your, your peers, the, the young men who were on the team? Or how did you see your role at the time? Well, the time in the nation was that uh, sports scholarships weren't being awarded. It was just academic. So the girls in my neighborhood, we always knew that we had to keep the grades up mm -hmm. to get the academic uh, awards and scholarships. Also, Title IX didn't come into realization until 1972. We were graduates of the 68-69 academic school year, so we had no protection under the law in terms of if we had an interest in a sport. So, and we came up in a community where the culture was, get an education. That's the passport to success in life. Everybody in our community talked about getting an education. So we really were interested in keeping our grades up and getting good grades and getting scholarships. As a matter of fact, we were 370 plus students and of that number, I know well over 50% got scholarships to uh, colleges and universities locally and, well, not so much locally, <laughs> but uh, uh, throughout the country. When it comes to the boys, you talk about boys dominating the sport, we were a family. So when we saw ball players, we knew them from elementary school. You know, they were in our classrooms. Um, we played sports with them outside. So it was like family members uh, doing a sport. So we just supported them 110%. We did not look at a, a, a situation where that uh, it was us supporting them and that we took a back seat. Uh, that was not our, uh, the case. So it wasn't a, a, a gender issue? At oh, no, not at all. No, not at all. So Jack, your, your father was, was legendary. Um, he made a difference in so many young, so many young people's lives, myself included, because he helped, he was instrumental in the founding of Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center. So I, I actually went to Fort Hayes. So I grew up walking up and down Jack Gibbs Boulevard. So, and he also has a very uh, amazing history with Ohio State. He, as I said earlier, he was known as the savior of the 1954 Ohio State Michigan game. He, the legendary Woody Hayes, was uh, instrumental in convincing the Columbus School Board to hire your father as East High School's first black principal. So your father was a trailblazer. Did you realize at the time the difference your father was making, or was, or was he just dad to you? Well, I, I think I did. I, I, we, as a child growing up, uh, he, well, he started East High School in 63, and, and we were, we didn't see him until about 9, 10 o'clock at night. Because he was there, he was there all day, every day, and all evening. 
And when, he, when I talked to him about it, he said, he said this is, I love this job. He said, this is my best job. You know, th this is, hey, this is it. I love it. And I, and I, I went to East High School, too. Now, I'm a 71 graduate. And uh, as a child, my sister and our mother, we went to, I believe we went to every basketball game, every football game. We, uh, it was just a marvelous feeling, man. It's just, uh, and we, I know people may not know, but we were, my sister and I, we were, where we lived, we lived in the Westerville School District. And uh, one day, the Westerville Schools, they invited my dad to come speak there. So he came, and he walked around, and we only had, I think, West, we only had 10 black students in the high school. So we had a teacher, it was just one Westerville school, and we had a teacher who was a George Wallace supporter. So I know, I know most of you know what George Wallace's uh, philosophies were, yeah. and whatever. Well, this teacher had pictures of George Wallace all over his room. So we had a mock presidential election at Westerville High School. George Wallace won the election. So, so my dad, he, he talked to us then, he said, he said, I think we need to make a move. And he, <laughs> he, he, he did, he, he had to pay, but he paid for my sister and I to go to East High School as, as an outside student. And that was the most, just a wonderful experience. I, I love these two, you know, many days I go in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, we stayed eight, nine o'clock at night, just walking around the hallways, talking to people, just a wonderful feeling. So yeah, he, marvelous part of his life and he, uh, he loved it. And we, we loved it, he loved it too. Great. So Bill, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Will and I were talking leading up to this event and Will pointed out that in 1974, two of the five NCAA All-American uh, men's basketball team players were from East High School, but none of them attended Ohio State. Why do you think those student athletes who led East High School to that historic championship in 68 and 69 were not recruited by Ohio State and offered athletic scholarships? Well, let me begin by saying I think the wonderful thing, one of the wonderful things about Will's book is it's more than just a great story of an underdog team doing well. It's also about the relationship between the team and the school, the school and the black community, the black community in the city, and the school in the city and the black community in the university. Uh, I think when a lot of people think of Ohio State, they think of an institution that's big, that's bureaucratic, that's opaque, and is monolithic. OSU is big, it is bureaucratic, and at times it is opaque. I think people un underestimate how much central control you can exert over a place that's that big. Now, what's that got to do with what we're talking about? The, the point I would make is that the OSU football team, if you look at OSU recruiting black athletes, Woody Hayes, the coach at the time, was way ahead of the rest of his peers in recruiting black athletes to Ohio State, treating them well, giving them scholarships, make sure they, they succeeded. Uh, so in that sense, you could say OSU was doing the right thing, if you will. Because of its big size, OSU is very decentralized, and in athletics, we tend to give the coaches a great deal of flexibility in how they manage their team. So that brings up the issue of basketball. Uh, and Fred Taylor, there were people that said Fred Taylor was not, um, not hospitable to recruiting blacks on the OSU basketball team. Um, <laughs> what I would point out is that Mel Knoll was one of the starters on that great 1960 team who was African-American. Jim Clemens was a, a big part of the 1968 team. But the fact that we highlight them means that they kind of stand out as exceptions. Both Mel Knoll and Jim Clemens have said that, that uh, uh, the coach was very supportive of them and they didn't feel that he had something against blacks. But even Fred Taylor's supporters say that Fred Taylor's strength was not recruiting. He kind of felt he could sit back and people would come to him instead of him going after people. Uh, and so that may be part of what's going on. And then you, there's also the issue of the baseball team because the East High baseball team was also very successful. There's not much of a paper trail, but the university yearbook, the Macchio, is online. So I went back, I was curious, and looked at the, 19, the picture of the 1966 OSU baseball team. 
And you can't always tell from looking at a picture who's what, but I didn't see any black faces in that squad. And I went ahead to 1968, which would have been the baseball team that was just before the, the East High team, and also I didn't see any black faces there. So there may have been something going on. Paul may have something, you know, know more about this than I do, but I think it's safe to say OSU's record in this area was mixed. The, no as important as athletics is, the bigger issue is how did OSU treat black students in the 60s? Was it a, uh, an environment that was really welcoming? And I think hopefully that's something we will discuss because I think there's some indication it was not and some things had to change and we can talk about why that happened and when it happened. So Will, Tigerland has really been winning rave reviews and I think uh, one of the reasons why it's gotten so much critical acclaim is that it's not just a sports book. It's not just about the East High School baseball and basketball teams. You really paint a picture of the era and, and anyone who knows anything about history knows how turbulent the 60s in 1968 in particular was, especially with that was the year that Dr. King was assassinated. So you describe the track stars, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, raising their fists at the 1968 Olympics. And you note that a UCLA basketball star named Lou Alcindor, who is of course now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, decided to boycott that year's Olympics in protest of, of racism and apartheid around the world. So fast forward, here we are 50 years later, you have President Trump criticizing Colin Kaepernick and other African-American NFL players for taking a knee during the national anthem in protest of police violence against black, black males and, and black people in communities in general. So why is the nation still divided over these issues 50 years later? Um, um, you know, history is something that we, we tend to run from in this country. And so you've had all these southern monuments, statues on these esteemed southern universities. And those monuments are, were emblems of terror. They were built to intimidate African Americans. Um, yet, the southern universities did not see fit to talk about how wrong it was to have student bodies walk past these monuments to these uh, uh, racist figures uh, who tried to upend this country. Um, and so when you have gaps and you have gaps as far as racial dialogue and you have uh, stereotyping that goes on and that is uttered by people running for high office, uh, it does set things back. There is no doubt about it. Uh, I did not vote for a hustling, hustling con artist reality TV star to go to the White House. <laughs> I didn't do that. I wasn't part of that army of voters who did that, but I have been a foreign correspondent. Mm -hmm. I've, seen, I've seen democracies fall right before my eyes. I've seen them fall. And they often fall when somebody at the top starts trying to divide a nation with ethnic cleansing or racial stereotyping. Uh, thus, we put kids in jail who are brown and black, who are at the border. Um, and, and so it's an easy, easy target to look at black athletes who make six figures and to tell them that they should only dribble and shut up. Rosa Parks, Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., the students who were arrested on this campus trying to bring more black faces in the administration, 
more black faculty. Uh, uh, they all are the reason why these black athletes have a right to speak up. And uh, we will see this fall in the midterms how serious this nation is about retaining its sense of self. And, and just, just to follow up, you mentioned being a foreign correspondent. Do you think that what we're experiencing in America now with all the division and it seems like in some ways we've gone backwards in race relations, is that something that's happening around the world? You see countries in Europe that are becoming hostile to immigrants, or is what we're experiencing in America something unique because of our history with slavery and um, blacks being denied rights? Yeah, well, let me talk about one man real quick. Uh, he's from Ohio. Uh, he fought for our freedom in World War II. Uh, Bob Hart who became the coach of East High School's basketball team. Uh, we can't be fooled again, ever again, by somebody who sits in the bleachers and taunts people uh, and mocks those who went to war, mocks those uh, who sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears uh, for this nation's freedom. Bob Hart was such a man. He landed at Normandy, okay? He wasn't in New York working with his daddy in a real estate company denying <laughs> blacks an opportunity to live in apartment buildings. Uh, um, Bob Hart's family is here, and I would love them to stand up. So Alice, in Tigerland, Will writes a lot about the ties that Dr. Martin Luther King had to Columbus because of his friendship with Reverend Fail D. Hale, who was a renowned pastor and civil rights activist here in Columbus. So Will writes about how Dr. King's friendship with Reverend Hale would often bring Dr. King to Columbus and he would stay with the Hales. And so growing up, were you aware of Dr. King's ties to Columbus because of the Hale family? Uh, sh <laughs> Surely. <laughs> Um, Reverend Hale had four children, um, Boots, then Janice, who was a 1966 graduate of East High School, had a third child, Marna, who was a 1968-69 graduate of East High School. <laughs> There's those tigers. Uh, and uh, the uh, last son was Hilton. I went to school from elementary through high school. You know, you have to realize in our community, we knew each other from kindergarten all the way through. So I would spend the night with, with uh, Martin. We have sleepovers. And so Reverend Hill always had somebody in the uh, house from many different places. But that held true for all of our black churches in the community. They always had people of stature from all over the country in their home and in their schools. So surely uh, Reverend Hill reflected what Dr. King was all about. And people in the community were uh, enlightened by the movement of blacks trying to better themselves. And so uh, we were really really aware of uh, the impact of uh, Dr. King. He came many times and, um, and would visit, but there was also a strong pastors and ministerial alliance in our community where they would come together and uh, develop programs to help within our community to better their lives and to um, help us achieve. So yes, he was instrumental. 
in uh, promoting uh, community unity. And uh, so, yes, I was very well aware of his uh, philosophy. Nonviolence, uh, community helping each other, uh, bringing us by our bringing us up and understanding that we need to be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin, and uh, yes. So to a lot of people, Dr. King is like this iconic figure that they, they didn't feel that they could necessarily touch. You know, he was like this saint-like figure, so since you had this personal tie to him, how, does, how did his assassination, you know, when you were in high school, how did, how did that affect you? I was very sad, but I was more vexed because I said, here was a man who preached nonviolence. He talked about leveling the pay, uh, playing field for everyone, who promoted love, who talked about um, sense of community, uh, folks helping each other. So I really was vexed that we would have people in America who could kill somebody like that who talked about love and peace and nonviolence. So I was vexed there and I said, there must be people who must be monsters. <laughs> I just really felt there are people who just have not accepted the importance of humanity and helping one another. Uh, so I was sad and vexed, but I was motivated because I was moved to know that he talked about us being responsible as citizens. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that even made me more uh, inclined to do better in school and to achieve and come back and give to the community. So it's good to know it didn't give you a sense of dis despair and hopelessness. It, it no, not you. hopelessness, uh -huh. but I was very vexed because I, I am a strong believer of humanity, that it is our responsibility to support one another as human beings and how somebody who preaches goodness and love and support of one another, that someone would have the audacity to get rid of a good person. <laughs> it was just uh, unbelievable. Right, right. So Jack, uh, in, in Tigerland, we'll talk about many of the, uh, the landmarks of the Near East Side community around East High School, including Port Poindexter Village, where your, your family once lived. So what are some of your memories of Poindexter Village and Carl Brown's grocery store and the Call and Post newspaper <laughs> and some of the other landmarks of the African-American community around East High School well, at that time? My, my mother, I don't remember, but when we lived there, I was, I think I was like, like maybe three or four years old. And my mother would, she told me about the, you know, strong sense of community and all that. She said, I, I guess once when I was three or four years old, I got, she gave me a bath and I, she hadn't put my clothes on yet, and I just ran out the door, man. I ran, I ran all through Poindexter Village, and I ran all the way around there, and the people in Poindexter Village brought me back to the house. And, they, and I, they, they took care of me when I got back. You know? <laughs> but, but just a strong sense of community, and, and many people may not know, but a lot of, yeah. a lot of people in Columbus that, that have done very well, the, the, in early years, they lived in Poindexter Village. Extra village, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it truly was a village. It, had it truly was a village. Yeah, very much so. Families and and people getting started in a real, real sense of uh, there was a uh, oh about 15, 20 years ago there was a reunion of, of Point Dexter Village people, and you'd be surprised at people that were there that had the success they they achieved and the, just the camaraderie and the and the, and the great uh, mm -hmm. the great feeling. Yeah, I don't remember it, but my mother would tell me, and and that a special a special time. And she said, my my dad then he was going to Ohio State, and he would he work at North American at night. And when he would, uh, we we lived on the. Uh, she said we lived on the top floor, and when he would get home at night, he would he would he would get in the bed and he would kick his shoes off, and they would drop on the floor. And the neighbors downstairs would complain, man. <laughs> boom, that was a boom every night. But no, great, great memories, though. Great memories, definitely. So when the highway was built and it kind of cut off Long Street from downtown, it seemed like that was the beginning of the, the Near East Side kind of losing that whole sense of community. Yeah, yeah. sense of things. And a lot of people, if you, 
if you, if you grew up in Columbus, you remember Mount Vernon Avenue as a boy. I remember my mother driving down Mount Vernon Avenue, and it would take you maybe 45 minutes from an hour to get down Mount Vernon Avenue because my mother, you would see people you knew all the way down Mount Vernon Avenue. they talk to you and socialize, and then you, you know, my mother might stop in Chesapeake and get a fish sandwich and yeah. all that stuff, man, or, you know, or Spencer's and a uh, restaurant and things, just a, just a real, real sense of community that we, that we, well, we kind of lost when all that division, yeah. division came. Yeah, it was special. So even though there was the upside of desegregation and African Americans being able to move out to other areas and live in the suburbs, right. do you feel like there's still that sense of community that in, in Columbus and the African American community, even though it's yeah. more spread out? I, I think we still have it in a sense. We, we do. It's there. And you know, the, uh, the, the, the uh, music events at maybe Moore Park, mm -hmm. Uh, still some things at Franklin Park, and then if you, I, I don't know if some of the people in the audience, but if you go, the old bag of nails at uh, Broad in Nelson, it's a lot of Eastside people go there on Friday after school, and, and old bag of nails, they have, they have tailored their menu to oh. Eastside, like they're, 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 it's the only old bag of nails in Columbus where all you can eat fish every night for $15. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so, so there's still some things there, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, Bill, I mentioned Tigerland. Will writes a lot about the turbulent racial climate of the 1960s. Can you elaborate on the, in, in your book, The Ohio State University in the, in the 60s, can you elaborate on the confrontations between Ohio State administrators and black students in 1968? Sure, let me, let me start by saying there were tensions already before 1968, but they hadn't in, erupted into a confrontation. And the feeling was that the university was not hospitable to blacks. And let me give you just one, one of the big issues was housing in the university area. Now the university residence halls were supposedly officially desegregated with the 1957 Civil Rights Act, but it didn't apply to any of the university had apartments, rooming houses, fraternities and sororities around campus. In the fall of 1965, so this would have been after the Civil Rights Act was passed in the summer, but before it was enforced, the university at the, at the behest of students did a survey of landlords of university approved housing in the area around the university. And one of the questions they asked them is, would you rent to black students? 42% said flat out no. Now you ask yourself, well, what about the other 58% of them? Half said yes, the other half didn't answer the question, which leads you to believe some of them wouldn't either. This is in the fall of 1965. So, and, and the student activists, both white and black, were trying to get the university to use its enforcement authority and university approved housing to require these landlords to do it or they wouldn't be on the list and the university refused. So you had those kinds of issues boiling around. What happened in 1968 then, it was after a speech on this stage, I was here at the time, Dick Gregory, the black comedian and activist, spoke to the campus community and there were uh, some black students who heard him talk about the importance of taking direct action. So they got together, they called themselves the Black Student Union. It was reportedly about 200 students and a delegation of them asked for a meeting with university officials in February of 1968 and they presented a list of uh, eight what they called demands, things like more black faculty, more black students. Uh, but it was a very civil meeting. The university promised to get back to them. The university did and started to make some changes. For example, they hired the first counselor in University College, uh, a black man, and, and they uh, hired a minority affairs coordinator. Well, then February goes into March, March goes into April, and of course, the beginning of April, Martin Luther King is assassinated, as we've talked about here. And as Will conveys so beautifully in his book, uh, it, it unleashed, uh, unleashed, unfortunately, a poison in the American bloodstream because it was a man committed to nonviolence and he was shot down in cold blood by a white man who obviously premeditated what he was going to do. And I was on campus at the time, and the same, it had the same effect here. It spooked everybody out and, and really made people afraid of what would, be hap uh, what would happen and afraid of each other. So in that environment, uh, the Black Student Union instituted what they called a takeover of the administration building, which is now called Bricker Hall, on April 29th. And the incident that precipitated it 
was when uh, a couple black women students were on a university bus and the bus driver thought they were being too noisy, so he stopped the bus and called the police to have them hauled off the bus. So that, in this environment, you can imagine what that did. So when the black students took over the administration building, and I was in the administration building that day to get a transcript or something, and a black student came up to me and said, uh, we're taking over the building. If you want to stay here overnight, you're welcome. If not, you probably ought to get out of here. And I left. <laughs> uh, and what they did by the takeover, they, they took telephone wire and actually they let anybody who wanted to leave, leave. And then they used the telephone wire to close the doors. Then they occupied the uh, office of the vice president for business and finance, to whom both the campus bus service and the campus police reported to. And they, they wanted something done on the spot about that incident, and he refused. Uh, and this went on for about six hours, and the, the black students then began to wonder, well, we've done this, now what happens? And fortunately, John Corverly, who was the provost, was in the building that day, and the black students trusted him, they had worked with him, and he talked to them, and along with some community leaders that were called in from the black community, they decided the best thing to do might be to issue a joint statement that will work on these issues, and leave the building, and they agreed to that. The black students left the building voluntarily. The police didn't have to be called. There was there was no there were no evidence of weapons or anything. No violence committed. Uh, there was a little bit of damage, but not a lot. And there was a joint statement issued that we would continue to look at these. So you would think this ended the issue, but it didn't. The university then subsequently initiated disciplinary proceedings against the leaders of the Black Student Union and threw 10 of them out of school that, that quarter. And in addition, then the Franklin County prosecutor, they got a list of the 34 students who were involved in the, in the uh, takeover and filed kidnapping charges against all of them, which is a felony mm -hmm. in Ohio, it still is. And that created a real uproar because again, there had been no violence done, no physical threats, but here the university had thrown the book at these students. So uh, there was a lot of back and forth about that. Uh, after about a year, it was settled out where the students pleaded guilty to a much minor misdemeanor charge. To, whi to white people, that meant, well, the system worked. That was an overcharge and it got fixed. To black people, it was, no, that's what's wrong in the system in the first place. Those students never been, should have been accused of a felony for what, what they did. So the quarter kind of staggered to an uneasy end. Of course, Robert Kennedy was assassinated at the end of spring quarter. Uh, there was a terrible fire in, in Lincoln Tower where two students died. And so in an, over an uneasy summer, then the issue was what would happen when classes started again in the fall. And I found in the archives a letter from two sociologists, the professors Corintelli and Dines, who operated an outfit called the Center for Disaster Research at the university. Today we would call that first responder training. It was one of the first of its kind in the country. And they would go out after a disaster and interview people. And among the disasters they, they interviewed people for were the uh, riots that occurred in Cleveland and other Ohio cities in the summer of 1966 and summer of 1967. So they, they had a lot of experience with the black community in Ohio. And what they told the university administrators was we're out a lot with the black community. What you, the university, needs to worry about is you're perceived as being not only unfriendly but hostile to black students. This last set of incidents is just the latest example. And it's not just the more younger, more militant leaders. Even the nonviolent religious leaders are really upset with the university. And if the angry uh, students who are black activists and the students that are upset about the Vietnam War ever got together, they could close this place down. That letter was never responded to, it was never, what, what they advocated was reaching out to the black community and also to the anti-war community, and the university was in no mood to do that. And even if the administration wanted to, the trustees were in no mood to do that. So they didn't, for a while it was quiet, but of course it all exploded in the spring of 1970. And a lot of people think that was related solely to the Vietnam War, it wasn't. The original strike that occurred on uh, April 29th uh, was a combination of the new black group, Afro-Am, who had a lot of the same grievances that the Black Student Union did from 1968, and anti-war people together that came together, and then an overreaction from Columbus police then started the whole um, 
series of riots and the university eventually closing down. So Will, writing a book that has this kind of historic scope, and you don't just talk about the East High School teams, you talk about Jackie Robinson, and you talk about so many issues that were going on in the, in the, the era. So writing such an exhaustive historic book, how did you decide what to include, what to leave out? What was that process like? Um, well, first, let me say, goodness gracious, it's just been fascinating yeah. to be on this panel yeah. with you all. Uh, fascinating. I mean, listening. I wrote the book, and I'm like <laughs> fascinated just to listen. And tomorrow, I leave for Dayton. I'd love to take y'all with me. <laughs> and, we love Dayton. Yeah. What time do we leave? <laughs> You stop at Bob Evans and start rolling. <laughs> um, history, history. I uh, knew, as a matter of fact, there's somebody here who asked me, um, and then they said, uh, uh, who's going to be interested in this book outside of Columbus? Well, who's interested in Friday Night Lights outside of Texas or Rudy? outside of Notre Dame University, um, or Hoosiers, Muncie, Indiana, is, is that it? Coach, Hoosiers, Muncie, Indiana. <laughs> and, and so when you write a book though, that has an intimate story against the epic backdrop, and then I think history helps you make it work. I really do, I think that Ed Ratliff and Garnett Davis and Dwight Lamar and Robert Wright and Kenny Mizell uh, and Alice Flowers and Cynthia Chapman, uh, uh, they are a part of history and it felt good to write them into history. It really did. And because so many people spend enough time trying to write, trying to write certain segments of society out of history. Uh, and so it felt good. Uh, it felt good to write about the angels, people like Paul Pinnell. People like Bob Hart. It just felt good to write a story of triumph um, in dark times. It just, you know, it just did. And I think students, uh, be they in Mississippi, or Chicago, or California, or New Mexico, uh, or Cincinnati, anywhere, white black, Asian, or Somalia, uh, girls, boys. Uh, if you have a bad day, read about these tigers <laughs> and how they woke up every day mm -hmm. and went at the world. I mean, they're awesome, you know, and to tell this story around the sweep of history really, really, uh, feels good, and uh, Bill, I thank you for writing your book because it was really one of the, uh, really one of uh, uh, many books that I found during this research process uh, uh, that really, uh, really told excellently what happened uh, here on this campus. In the, in the flip side of that, speaking of history, Look at OSU now. They have a black president and a black athletic director, and they certainly should be given credit for that. Uh, that is very admirable, and uh, you know, uh, it's a pretty interesting story when you can find something intimate and then weave it through the epic, epic tunnel of history. So, Paul. Um Speaking of the the speaking of epic history, so Will goes into the history of the Negro Leagues and Jackie Robinson 
integrating Major League Baseball in, in Tigerland. So when you were coaching East High School's baseball team, which was predominantly black, uh, what do you make of the fact that now African Americans' participation in baseball is now at a historic low? What, what do you think has contributed to that trend? It was all black. It was all black, not, not predominantly, predominantly black. black. Okay. The team was all it was, black. It was all black. <laughs> yes. 15 out of 15. Wow, wow. So, so what, ca what has caused the trend of, of, especially in Major League Baseball, um, there being so few African Americans? And, and is there anything that can be done to, to bring more blacks into baseball? Well, I'm going to lay the blame right at the feet of African-American men today who have not taken up the fight. When I was at East High School coaching baseball, I was the beneficiary of a neighborhood baseball program called the Peers Club. And that was operated by four outstanding African-American men who were just phenomenal role models for those kids. Not only teaching baseball, but teaching them accountability, responsibility, all the things that they need to succeed in life. And when those kids got to East High School, then we had a jump on it. But today, and I've talked to some of my former players about this. I said, you guys did not do your job. When your kids were growing up, when you played baseball, why weren't your kids playing baseball? Why weren't you coaching their team? Why weren't you organizing a neighborhood team? So I think it begins right there. And if, if the, the male role models don't step in and, and do what they need to do, it's not going to get any better. So you're saying the players didn't pass the legacy on to the next generation? Absolutely. Do you think there's some like logistical issues? Like, for example, it's just easier to pick up a basketball and go to a court than it is to try to find a baseball diamond. If you just need less equipment, you can just pick up a football and play anywhere. Do you think that's part of it? I think that's a factor. but. In the past several years, Major League Baseball has put a lot of money into inner city baseball yep. programs. Yep. yep. And but I don't think it's been followed up on. I don't think the, the people who need to be leading this charge have done their job. Do you think that maybe African American youth don't necessarily like some of the history has been lost that they don't necessarily know about Hank Aaron or Jackie Robinson? Just seems like it was his history was so far away and so remote that they don't look up to those legends the way they do like someone like LeBron James or? I'm, I'm sure that's a part of it, but there, there's a lot of video yeah. <laughs> out there that's yeah. available. Uh, and uh, something, something has to be done to, to get the kids playing again. There's just no question about it, and, and they're not. I, I've got one of my players is here tonight. We'll refer to Garnett Davis. He works at a, at a facility. He said, we've got a million dollar baseball diamond over there. It sits there unused. So, you know, that, that's an opportunity, but it's not taking place. He's in the audience, and uh, it'd be nice if he stood up. Where's Mr. Garnett Davis? So Alice, you went on to a successful career as a teacher in the Columbus City Schools. And one of the pivotal uh, historic moments that Will writes about is Judge Robert Duncans, who was a black Republican judge um, in the 60s, his decision to integrate the Columbus schools in, in the 70s. But it seems like we're sort of back to de facto segregation in, in the Columbus schools, be, you know, because of white flight and just because of the reality of people tend to flock where people who are like them, people tend to live in, among people who are like them. So what do you think can be done to promote integration in the schools and make sure that all public schools have the same adequate resources? You know, that's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it takes in real estate, it takes in fairness and jobs, it takes in equity and payment. Um, when I first started as a teacher in Columbus, public school, which is now Columbus City Schools in 1972, we had 120,000 students. And that was before Judge Duncan come up with the um, uh, head of desegregation and to activate the 1954 <coughs> law, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, I think that um, we as a nation 
have to come to the realization that all children are important and that our most precious resource is the child. We need to stop looking at the stock market, looking at fossil fuels, tariffs, and come to know that our most precious resource is the child and put the money there. Put the money into them. Just think about you out here in the audience. As a child, you could not work because child labor laws were in effect, so you couldn't have a job, and then you couldn't vote. So it took responsible, uh, responsible adults to get you to where you are. So children have absolutely no power. But if we as a nation reflect the, the importance of thought that they are most precious research, resource, then we will get ahead with that. In terms of improving jobs, we need to uh, level the playing field. We have inequities in job. We have um, just this last couple months, we didn't have school for a couple of days because we had children in buildings that were extremely hot, registering 90 degrees. In 2018, why are we having children in buildings that don't have efficient and adequate heating and cooling units? And we have to move away from that idea that you have to have the right zip code to get the correct and valid uh, education. So it's need, it needs to be a national movement. Um, we have to come to be fair and have that community conversation and talk about real issues and a sense of fairness across the board with understanding that we must first respect that we must deal much more effectively with our most precious resource, which is the child. So Jack, I would kind of like to follow up and ask you sort of the same question as an attorney. How significant was it, Judge Duncan's decision to, to order the busing that desegregated the schools? And there was obviously I, a lot of pushback. You know, as, as a lawyer and as just as a, as a Columbus student and just as a, just as a person who's watched all history, I, I, think, I think maybe we, I, I think everyone had the right intentions about you know, desegregation will make everything better, but I don't know if it made everything better because it, it, when you look at what happened to Columbus, the, uh, um, we had white flight from Columbus schools. Not only did we have white flight, but we had, um, we had middle class black flight, wanted to go suburbs, and, and what we've been left with is, is not the school system we had before DSEG. And then, then I might throw in something too, I, I, I don't know, like, like may have been part of something in my back of my father's head. I don't know if anyone here has ever researched the, the uh, uh, Rosenwald schools now, a man named Rosenwald, he was a, he was a multimillionaire who, who helped found Sears. Mm -hmm. And what he did, he, with his millions, he built schools for blacks all through the South and funded these schools. Now, my dad went to one of these schools in Harlan, Kentucky. Now, it's really ironic that these schools funded by the Rosenwald Fund were were better funded than the white schools in the same area. They had bands, they had football teams, they had cheerleaders. They, uh, the Rosenwald Fund provided homes for the teachers. They had, they had teachers with advanced degrees. And they, they were getting a better education than, than, than the whites. And, and I don't know if you didn't follow my dad. My dad, my dad was skipped two or three grades of West High School. He graduated from Ohio State, summa cum laude, all with a desegregate or, or a segregated school background. So I wonder, I wonder, have we, I think we had good intentions. I think we may have lost the, lost the ball or dropped the ball with the deseg thing. We may have created something that didn't 
turn out the way it should have turned out. Jack, mm -hmm. I don't know how far you are yeah. in the book. But yes, there's I'm a getting lot. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot about the Rosenwald School. Yeah, I know. Dan yeah, yeah, yeah. Will and I went to Harlan, Kentucky together. Harlan, Kentucky together. Seven, seven hours in a car together. And we, we learned a lot, I learned a lot about Will, learned about me. But yeah, go ahead, Will, yeah. Please. Yeah, and well, you know, I sort of think I should stop right there because your dad graduated summer come laudy and I graduated summer come lucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think I'll stop right there, move on to the next question. <laughs> So Bill, in, in Tigerland, um, Will points out that William Oxley Thompson, who was president of Ohio State from 19, 1899 to 1924, and was also a member of the Columbus School Board, once declared, it is in the best interest of both races that they be educated in separate schools. So how has Ohio State and higher education in general evolved over the past several decades in terms of um, embracing and promoting diversity? both in the student body and among the faculty and administration? Well, evolve is a good choice of words. Uh, it often takes OSU a long time to get to the right place, but they usually get there. Let me give you just a, a couple examples. Um, I mentioned when we last talked, the end of the 1968 school year, things were very tumultuous as a result of the administrative building takeover and so forth. And the people probably most resistant to change, even more resistant than the university administration, were the university trustees who are all white males, there's nothing wrong with being a white male, but they're all white males <laughs> over 50, and it was all of them. And there was no diversity on the board of trustees. <laughs> Governor Rhodes, who had a very good relationship with the black community, decided it was time for OSU to have a black trustee for the first time, and it was Jack's father who he appointed to the board of trustees. Meanwhile, the students were pushing, both black and white students, to do something about segregated housing in the campus area. So they finally got a resolution together that uh, the administration said it would support, that said if you had university registered housing, you cannot discriminate against our students. Now that would seem to be obvious. It took 10 years to get there, but they finally got it together, but it required board of trustees approval. And so it came up to the board and the person who got to make the motion as one of his first acts on the board of trustees was Jack's father. And in fact, there was, and the, and the, Resolution, one trustee walked out and wouldn't vote on it, wouldn't explain why he didn't do it, but the others voted for it, and that became the law of the land. So that at least dealt with that issue. The problem was, as I mentioned, the university thought cracking down on, quote, troublemakers was the best way to keep the peace, and for a year or so, the, and it's really interesting, there's a parallel between what happened at OSU and what happened at East High School. So you had a lot of tension brewing, but the fall of 1968 was OSU's football championship. And again, Woody's team had a large number of African-American football players, which was very unusual at the time. So that kind of set a feeling of good feeling on the campus. But a, a, a good feeling like that, as important as athletics is, can't overcome the larger social problems. And as I mentioned, uh, tensions just build up. And in the spring of 1970, they exploded. The university's administration, I think, admitted that they got caught asleep at the switch by the degree of resentment OSU students had over race issues, over a number of different issues. To their credit, once this happened, it was kind of a wake-up call, and they started to take steps in addition to, to enforcing the housing, fair housing statute. So they moved to hire more black faculty and more black administrators. They moved to admit more black students and to give them the help they needed to succeed. They established a black studies department, and all that happened over the, late, the early 1970s. So the university began to change. And as you mentioned, we now, it, it was unthinkable that we would have had a black president or a black athletic director 50 years ago, but now it's accepted. Um, so the university's had some success. I, I looked up the university's figures. They report now, this is according to the university's figures, that now 5% of the students and 4% of the faculty are African American. And that's about double what those proportions were 50 years ago, but 13% of Ohioans are African American, so the university still has a way to go. One encouraging sign is that when black students are admitted here, they're much more likely to be successful. In the early 70s, if a black student was admitted to Ohio State, 
the odds that they were gra would graduate in four or five or six years were less than one in five. Wow. So in other words, only 28 percent, a little over one in five, a little over 28 percent succeeded. The rest, what a terrible message yeah. to bring those students here, have them not be successful. Now we've got that percentage up to 72 percent, which is a hell of a lot better than what it was then. It's still below what the average is for white students, which is a little over 90. So there has been progress, but there's a lot of progress that still needs to be made. Right. So I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions before we open it up to questions from the audience. So, Chris, no, 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 no. Pardon? We got a book signing. Okay. Well, Will wants to sign your book, so we will go ahead and open it up to questions from the audience. So if you want to come up to one of the microphones if you have questions. While we're waiting for the audience, at one point I'd like to say something about Mayor Sensenbrenner. Sure. We get a chance if, if everybody's... Not well, now. We'll go ahead and take go, No, go ahead. What, what did you have to say about Mayor Sensenbrenner? Well, just do a, Will does a wonderful, Mayor Sensenbrenner was the mayor of Columbus during almost the entire 1960s. He was a very contradictory figure. He was a Democrat. He was a delegate for John Kennedy in 1960. He did a lot of good things for Columbus, including the annexation policy, the parks, the zoo, and everything else. Initially, he had good relations with the black community, but as the 60s went on, he became more and more a law and order mayor, yep. and in fact sounded a lot like George Wallace. Wow. Now we've talked a lot about despair right now, and, uh, and, and, and what I want to give you is just one set of figures. Mayor Sensenbrenner was reelected in 1967 by a margin of 40,000 votes out of 117,000 people that voted. Not that he got 40,000 votes, his margin over his yep. opponent was 40,000 votes. He was up for reelection in 1971 after all this stuff happened. It was also after 18-year-olds had been given the right to vote, and students here at OSU developed a thing called Register Here to get young people to vote. In the 1971 mayor's election, 145,000 people voted, compared to 117,000 in, in 1967. In 1967, Mayor Sensenbrenner won by 40,000 votes. In 1971, he lost by 1,000 to Republican Tom Moody, who today we would describe as an establishment Republican. They did an analysis after the election of where Mayor Sensenbrenner lost all these votes. It was two places, the black wards in the city and the university district. So it was a case where elections do matter. Uh, it was gradual, but the city of Columbus under Mayor Moody and succeeding mayors changed the way the police related to the black community. We went into community policing, became much more open and open to diversity, and a lot of it came out of that one election. So I think that's an important lesson that came out of this. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your indulgence on this particular <laughs> factoid. Hi. Uh, my question is for Will. You talked about being an international reporter and seeing democracies fall. Uh, I'm very concerned about where we are right now, and I want to know if you ever saw, first of all, I feel like we're on the brink. I want to know what your opinion is about that. but. Did you ever see democracies get to this point and then be able to turn it around? Uh, yes. Uh, South Africa. They were at a very, very low point racially, and then they were able to turn it around. Uh, I don't think uh, we should underestimate where we are in this country right now. Um, um, it is it is a very perilous time. Uh, there is no doubt about it, and the world is watching. Having been a foreign correspondent, there are friends of mine who live all over the world, <clears throat> and they are shocked at what's happening in this country. One of the things that I personally, as a historian, do not understand, there's a friend of mine writing a book about this very issue. Uh, <clears throat> in these key states, in these key states, Ohio, Michigan, in Pennsylvania, white women put Trump over, white women. Now, a friend of mine, has been working on a book for the past two years. Why they did it, 
I'm, I'm very eager to read that book because women's rights are under attack now almost, almost daily from what's going on in Washington. There's no sugarcoating it. Uh, Roe v. Wade is now, I think, in trouble. I do. Uh, heck, some southern states only have one clinic for women. Uh, um, you know, and these clinics do more than just allow a woman to have an abortion. They're also health clinics, and, and you can talk to somebody if you're being abused and all of that. And, you know, why? Why black women didn't vote for Trump? So why white women would have visited this upon this nation is very unsettling. I hope some answers are in this book. Um, I'm wondering if I should mention the book since I'm trying to sell Tigerland tonight. <laughs> <laughs> No, but my friend Ben Bradley Jr. has written a book, and, uh, and it's also out right now, and, and I'm very eager to read it so I can find out why this happened. Mm. But you do think there's hope for us. Yes, we will come back from it, yes. America is very strong, is very strong. It was President Lincoln who said, a house divided cannot stand, mm -hmm. and so uh, we will unify and so we can stand up again. I'm very confident of that. Thanks. Hey, Mr. Haygood, I've, uh, I'm the teacher who's been pestering you with emails about coming to our school. Um, Where? Which school? Columbus Alternative High School. Yes. I'm there. I'm there. Sometime we're going to work it out. Well, and I, I think next summer's uh, Tiger Lamb will be required reading for at least one of our classes. We have a pretty good summer reading program. Oh, now I'm definitely there. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> and uh, one thing I, I wanted to talk about was, uh, well, I've been a public school teacher. It's my 31st year. My wife's a, we both teach in Columbus. She's here volunteering, ushering tonight. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Our, our children, our daughter graduated Fort Hayes, and we, we thought and we made the decision that we were gonna, if we were gonna teach in the city schools, we we're gonna live in the city. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, I don't have a lot of patience for colleagues who take a reasonable paycheck and send their kids to private schools. I, I, it just, it just rubs me the wrong way. And when I was growing up in the greater Cleveland area, I went to high school with the Trestles in Berea, and uh, the, the inner city with Cleveland was always a sort of terra incognita to me. I just didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And now I find myself in an urban school and trying to explain to these kids why their school system gets an F. Mm. And every urban district in this state, except Akron, which got a D. Yeah. And a school system like Bexley right next door, I believe they got an A, which a. I don't know if it has anything to do with the color of demographics, I'm just guessing. But uh, in trying to explain to them, I also teach government, which is really a thankful job these days. <laughs> yeah. And when they ask me these questions, I'm like, like I got any answers. So I'm wondering how, this is just the age old question and maybe I'm just rambling about the funding and the equity. And I think people do think education and money into education is important for their kids. Right. Uh, I'm still wearing shorts. Our school was the one where an administrator collapsed two weeks ago with heat stroke and was hospitalized for three days. Ooh, wow. That's why our school was closed. Our building was built in 1929. We have these ginormous fans, these industrial fans to get air through the hallways. You can't hear anything. And uh, trying to explain to these kids, what, you know, what does this tell you about how society sees you? Yeah. And why are you getting the F? And the society that treats you this way is not getting an F. I mean, you didn't bring this upon yourselves. And I, I, I'm not all the way done with Tigerland, and I'm hoping there's more in there, but if not, I'm wondering what the sequel's going to be uh, <laughs> as the schools shifted from these, I mean, I look at these beautiful buildings like East and West, yep. and I live by North High School, and that they just Cult changed over the years. Cult and I'd like to see Cult more of that talk about when the support for the schools just left. Right. And I'll, I'll be emailing you again. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I sort of think Chris is motioning to me that that's the last question, or maybe this is going to be yeah, the last we'll make, question. Yeah, we'll make you the last question. But, but wonderful point, well taken. Um, I personally miss Mr. Arnie Duncan, who was the last education secretary. I miss him. So I'll just leave it at that. I miss Arnie Duncan. Yeah, thank you, first of all, the panel, for all your comments and sharing your knowledge uh, in regards to this subject. Uh, it's really appreciated, and I know Columbus really appreciates the time that you spent. The question I have is, is really related to uh, the student athlete in regards to being paid in some form or fashion for their services rendered uh, during their their tenure at the university. There's been a lot of debate about whether students should be paid or not paid. Uh, they get, they're called student athletes, uh, they get scholarships, but scholarships really don't cover the full economic uh, requirements for a student nowadays. With the finance department and legal uh, comments and the coaching comments, I'd really like to hear your, your thoughts on the pros and cons about creating some type of, uh, of financial payment for students, uh, for student athletes as they perform their, uh, their uh, particular expertise as an athlete. Bill, Bill, that's, a, I mean, that's well, right up your alley. I'm retired from the university. I'm, I can, uh, I guess, speak by opinion. I have kind of mixed feelings about this. You'd like to keep the traditional view that, um, you know, athletics at the coll collegiate level is not supposed to be money driven and it's supposed to be pure and all that. And in fact, the scholarships students receive do have a worth because they can graduate then without debt. The problem that bothers me is uh, at the higher levels, there's a certain amount of hypocrisy about this because we don't pay the students, but boy, the president, part of his evaluation and salary is based on how well we fundraise and how well we do athletically. The athletic director and the coaches get various, uh, they get good salaries, but they also get bonuses for winning. So, and then the NCAA is supposed to police all this and they pick on nitpicky little, sometimes, nitpicky little violations. But meanwhile, all this money's flowing back and forth to the university and to elsewhere. So it's a contradiction, and it's a huge one. And I think at some point, whenever you have a contradiction like that, the system collapses on itself. And I would hope some way we can find out how to deal with that before it happens. How we do that, I don't know. I think more equity for students would be important. But boy, if it becomes totally money-driven, then what's the difference between collegiate athletics and the pros? So, you know, the, the pros and cons, I think, are pretty clear. The system, current system is not fair. The current system is hypocritical. How can you move to a system that's less so without being so money-driven? Uh, that, that's really the dilemma I see. Well, before we wrap up and uh, go out to the book signing, I just wanted to say something real quickly. So I would actually like to ask Sherry to come back to the stage real quickly. And while Sherry is making her way to the stage, I just wanted to say that, Will, you, you've made it to a level where uh, a lot of people would just kind of ignore their hometown, but you have maintained your Ohio roots and you're an inspiration to us all. So in, my, in, in light of that, I have a little token. I know that you are a proud alumnus of Miami University, <laughs> but you will always be a Buckeye. So this is a picture frame, so hopefully you can put a picture from tonight and remember all of us. So thank you for coming again. Oh, thank you, thank you, Chris. Thank you. And to Sherry, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all that you've done to advocate for the arts uh, over the past 25 years. Thank you for helping to put Columbus on the map. Thank you for supporting the arts in Columbus and for being such a staunch, tireless advocate. So, thank Aww. you so much. <laughs> we love you and we appreciate you. So nice. thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.